Okay, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm just going to turn on the closed captioning. Okay, wait. Okay, so I'm really happy to uh, welcome you all um, to our first uh, Buyer's Remorse event this evening. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I am just going to kick some things off with some introductions and some information before we properly get started. My name is Nicholas Singh. I'm going to facilitate this evening. Um, in this uh, context, I'm speaking as teaching fellow in fine art for Leeds University um, and I'm also part of the Buyer's Remorse team um, and I'll do more, yeah, more info and more introductions later but just to say that Buyer's Remorse, the project, is the, it's the brain child baby of Zipporah, Blake, Graves Ande and Carmen Akome. And it's supported by me and also Helen Graham, who is Associate Professor in Cultural Studies at um, Leeds University. Um, so in the Zoom room, we're likely a mix of students and staff from the University of Leeds um, and people from elsewhere. So welcome everyone. So some notes about the structure and the setup of the event. We are recording the session because there's quite a lot of people that um, couldn't make it in. Um, so we're going to record this event and it will be available on the Buyer's Remorse website for a while. So if you'd rather not have um, yourself visible in your Zoom tile on the recording, you can just switch your camera off now. Um, we'd also be really grateful um, if everyone could meet themselves during the talk, um, just to minimise any background noise or interference. We will be having a break about halfway through. We are live captioning the event. Um, and just to let you know that you can change the size of the text by hitting the little arrow that's next to live transcript, the up arrow. If you tap that, you can change the size of the subtitle and you can also choose to have a view, uh, a view full transcript. So then it'll come up along the right side of your screen and it'll be separated into um, speakers, so who's speaking. So I hope it's not perfect. Um, but I hope it is, it is helpful um, for those that need it. Um, I also wanted to say that we were very aware that we've not organised um, British Sign Language Interpretation for this event. Um, we do want to make it available for future events um, where needed. And we'd like to ask anyone booking on for future events who does require BSL to email and let us know. Um, I also wanted to say that we realise this process is quite lacking and it's clumsy, um, what we're proposing and myself and Helen Graham as members of staff at the university, we're in the process of kind of researching into the university's policies around access for public events um, and we see this as part of, of the wider work in developing our institutional awareness around needs and access and please feel free uh, to write to me privately in the chat or to Helen Graham at any point in the event um, so in the chat you can just select my name Nicholas Singh or Helen Graham and um, if you've got any questions or concerns or if you want to share any information about access needs and we will do our best to meet those in this talk um, or if it's not possible right now for future events.
Okay, there's all the stuff. Um, so, now the good stuff. Buyer's Remorse. Um, Buyer's Remorse is a project initiated by Zipporah, Blake, Graves and and Carmen Okome. And it's formed in response to Zipporah and Carmen's own experiences and others' experiences of structural racism while studying fine art and history of art at the University of Leeds. Um, so a bit of an overview of the project. Um, it extends a lineage of initiatives organised by students of colour in the school previously. And there's many strands to the project. And this includes workshops, resources, talks, um, and a complaints desk. So central to the project is this complaints desk. Um, and Sapora and Carmen were inspired by the Guerrilla Girls um, 2016 project, Complaints Desk. And it was um, Sephora and Carmen's idea to create um, our own complaints um, desk where students and staff can anonymously file a complaint relating to experiences or observations of structural racism in the school that they've experienced or that they've observed. Um, these complaints, they're then they're submitted to the Buyers Remorse website and also displayed here. Um, what it does is creates a kind of a bit of a mucky pattern of events um, which intends to encourage change in the school. Um, for those of you in the audience that are um, part of the school in any way, um, the complaints desk is, is open um, for complaints. Um, for those of you who aren't part of the school, it's um, a resource that we still hope that you might find um, useful and enlightening in some way. We'll share links to the website at the end of the talk. Um, and I just wanted to add, um, also by way of introducing today's speaker, that in the course of working together with, um, with Sephora and Carmen and Helen, um, I came across some thinking from Sarah Ahmed in relation to their concept of Complaints Collective. Um, and this has got on to significantly inform our thinking. I think we all find it pretty deeply energising. So I wanted to share a quote from uh, Sarah Ahmed to, yeah, to like learn some things um, before introducing our speaker for today. So, um, Sarah Ahmed says of their book, Complain, um, and that's due to be published in October this year by Duke University Press. Um, she says this book is a complaint collective. It's a collective of oral and written testimonies from academics and students who have made complaints about harassment, bullying and unequal working conditions at universities. She says a complaint collective can be a feeling we have of being there for each other, with each other, because of what we have been through. And we recognise each other from what we have been through, and we can even know each other. And it can be hard to convey in writing how much that feeling matters. And as a complaint collective, we combine that combination can be a matter of hearing. And in writing this book, Sarah Ahmed says, I listened to each account and I listened again, transcribing, reflecting, thinking and feeling. Complaint offers a fresh lens, which is also an old and weathered lens on collectivity itself. So, um, just giving thanks for that, for that thinking. And I wanted to add that, um, I guess, following a long lineage of black feminist and feminist of colour critiques of the university um, and feeling really galvanised by Sarah Ahmed's research, it's, it is our intention this evening to create a complaint collective um, with you all here and now. Um, so all of that up in the air, 
Um, I'm really, really pleased to hand over to our headliner uh, speaker, Serena Mohammed, um, who's kicking things off for the Buyer's Remorse um, Speakers Programme. Uh, Zarina is an art critic and one half of The White Cube, where she writes about exhibitions, how art makes her feel and how institutions operate. Um, Zarina is joining us today to share their own experiences in the sector, um, to complain away and to call us into this collective energy that Sara Ahmed describes. So just before I spotlight um, Serena, we're going to do questions from the audience in the second half of the event. Um, so please, if you don't mind, just saving your questions up um, for the chat until then. Okay. Serena, I'm just going to Put the spotlight on you. Ah, oh, well, it's always horrifying when <laughs> <laughs> your own face pops up. Um, do you know what? Let me, I'll put it on gallery view. So I'll be really small for myself, but hello. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, today I am going to, right, this is going to be the format my complaints are going to take. I'm going to have a whinge, obvs, um, but because it's like I could natter on forever, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a timer. So there's like a finite end point to this. Um, I'm going to do 30 minutes, I think, right? Yes. Okay. Um, it reminds me of when I was a student and like, you know, when you're just in the library having a minor meltdown. Um, I think I saw on Twitter, like a joke about like, oh, I saw a girl in the library set a timer to have a cry in. That's what this is. Um, so yes, I'm gonna talk about, I guess like the weird racialized shit we've experienced in the art world. Um, although it seems like this might be all I bang on about, I don't think we as art critics are, you know, like we, we talk about this anecdot anecdotally or like, I guess informally on Twitter, like we kind of, we do the goss as like a side chat, but I don't know if any of this shit ever really makes it onto the website, um, which is what, like, that's where everything gets archived, right? Like that's where majority of the criticism takes place. And, and so in some ways, it feels like we perhaps aren't as forthright about the very batshit racist stuff that has happened to us. So I'm gonna try and picture it in two ways. One, by like <laughs> reliving <laughs> some of these quite batshit moments. And then also having a look at the stuff that's on the website and trying to trace back the ways that I've um, written through or around these things um because yeah i think i just from my own perspective i think sometimes it feels like all i do is bang on about racism in the arts and i mean it's five years of it five and a half years of doing this and i, f I feel like I've, I've i've put in some time as a whinger and like a, a person complaining about these things but um, I think when I like when I was preparing for this, I was having a read of some of the stuff I've written because I don't remember it, um, and it's actually not that much. Or I've written about it in quite a contained way, or I've tried to approach the same problem from multiple different angles, or like in 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 these different ways, depending on how I'm feeling and what's going on. Um, But yeah, maybe a good place to start would be for me to talk about some of these weird interpersonal moments that me and Gab experience together, because I, it is together that we kind of experience them. In some way, part of me feels bad <laughs> for dragging her in to, like, she's a white woman, like, she wouldn't, um, I guess, experience some of this weird shit if it weren't for me and the way that like we're collectively 
seen together. Like, I think people think that we live together. We we ride to work on the same tandem bicycle. Like it's it's Gavin's arena, right? And so in some in some like fucked up way, I do feel a little bit bad for. I don't know, the shit that gets thrown at us because, it, you know, it's gendered, but it's also racialized. Like, um, but then also sometimes it like deals with us as these two very separate entities that get treated differently. Like, um, one thing I have noticed, or like we've both noticed consistently, is that like sometimes we'll be in a conversation, like maybe it's really formal, maybe it's like, we're having like an actual meeting with someone um but sometimes it is just like we're at an opening and it's like super cash but we'll be we'll be chatting to one person and they'll be speaking to both of us but only making eye contact with gap and it's like in those moments i really appreciate having her there after they're gone to turn to me and be like that was weird wasn't it like they just looked at me and i'm like oh yeah okay right that's not like the first time that happened and she mentioned it I was like oh yeah you're right that's like that's a, that that's racialized it took her pointing it out for me to be like oh shit yeah um like you know who who are you as a person willing to accept or kind of who's an acceptable to you face for what we do like of course if you're like if you've got this like racist implicit bias um then you'd see Gab, the white one, as the one with authority or the one worth speaking to, or like, you, you know, you direct your attention towards the person who you perceive to be like the one within, I don't know. Like, uh, that's my conspiracy theory about it. In, I mean, I mean, I think that is true as well. Um, like that must be it. I, I'm, I'm framing it as a conspiracy theory. I don't think it is. I think that's kind of it. Because speaking to other people, like other friends of mine who are like POC, um, it kind of it feels like quite a consistent thing. Like if they are in a room, like why people don't want to look you in the eye in some way. Um, so that's interesting. I think that's an interesting tidbit. It's like. As a phenomenon, it fascinates me. Um, but like, I think that's one end of the spectrum. That's like a very kind of, <laughs> I was about to say it's harmless. It is kind of, like, it's not like, I'm not getting called racial slurs in those situations, you know? Um, I'm not getting death threats. Like, it's just someone that doesn't want to look me in the eye and no offense, I don't want to look them. Like, you know, that's fine. Comparatively, that's harmless. At the other end of the spectrum, there's something quite batshit, um, really batshit. And I don't, I think I've only ever like alluded to this publicly, but um, in 2019, I had to report a death threat to the police. Um, I didn't want to go to the police, first of all, because the police like I, what, the, what the fuck are they gonna do and of course they didn't do anything I had to report a death threat to the police it was a second death threat we got from this guy and this death threat included the peace alert and um I remember talking about it with Gab and she was like well maybe you should report it and I was like no, yeah, that's not that bad. And she was like no maybe you should report it because like this was a person that was sending death threats to other people as well that we were aware of and like we were all in the same group chat with these people like other people of color and Gap was like maybe if we report it this could be like a, a thing like maybe this will be the thing that gets them and I kind of like reported reported this death threat of course nothing happened but it was really weird it was really weird it was um It was a guy that was that, that like works in the art world is like art world adjacent like is adjacent to like teaching institutions um and has just been living this like separate online life sending 
like actual vitriol to people of color in the arts just via email living his life and like it's I mean it's people of color it's just women generally and um some of it like it's racist it's sexist it's very specifically anti-semitic um it's quite mental um but yeah this this second email included a drawing and it was like a, a horrible cartoon and it was like I mean, that wasn't the worst part, but I think for me, it made me feel like this guy was actually dangerous, like a little bit unhinged because it, I don't know, that's some like, that's some like criminal mind shit, you know? Um, <laughs> that's some like serial killer shit. And I remember talking to my dad about this because, um, <laughs> I remember talking to my dad about this because he was like I think he my dad's just like some big bald Bengali man from Tottenham like he does not know what I do why I do what I do but he's just really really happy that I'm doing it like he's just like do your best love it for you fuck those guys and I'm like yeah cool but he that was the first time he said to me maybe you need to be a bit careful about not what you're doing, but how you're doing it. And it, yeah, that made me like really think about like the way that we post things. Like even if I'm like just on Instagram stories, like there's something in the background and if it's near my house, I'll be like, oh shit, like that's my local bus stop. Like that's, that's the bus stop nearest me. Will people be able to find where I am? Like, and if, like, if there's one guy that's like fucking serial killer crazy, and you know what I mean? Like the like going to the police was not a nice experience. Of course it wasn't. Like they came over to my house, two of them in their big fuck off bulletproof vest things with like, and it, this guy sat across from me, this police officer sat across from me, looked me in the eye and said, maybe you should reconsider the way, like maybe you should stop put, like putting things online. And I was like, no offense, babe, but that is actually my job. This is my source of income. If you're telling me that the only way I can avoid racial abuse and death threats is to stop publishing online, like if that's the fix in your mind, then like we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> we're not going anywhere. And um, like, but that was their that was their advice. They were like, yeah, maybe stop putting things online. Be careful about how you use the internet and don't say stuff that will piss people off. And I'm like, saying like to get like cast out on email you know um that's the other end of the spectrum and like that's not the only time we've had death threats which seems like a very casual way to say something actually insane like that's crazy that's crazy like that's it's it's not this isn't normal that's not normal i'm dropping it very casually this feels like therapy um <laughs> this isn't that's not a normal thing to happen um yeah, it's quite weird um on on the other end i do you know what i'm really enjoying talking about i guess the more <laughs> violent shocking end of this because like part of me is <laughs> like things like that are a bit funny like <laughs> If you can't laugh, um, but it is a bit funny. Like it, this is a weird job. This is a stupid job for me to have. I am like just an idiot with an internet connection in my own mind. I don't know. I don't want to think about like how many people read the texts or like how many people, you know, I don't want to think about it in that way. In my mind, the only people that read the texts are Gab and my ex-boyfriend who like inevitably stalks me on the internet. Like that's, that's those are the only people, that's my audience. And I wanna like impress Gab and intimidate my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> and like, that's the way I have to conceptualize it. But like, I, I, it's still a weird job, regardless of how I'm conceptualizing it. So, because it's a weird job, that weirdness feels funny. And the, like, the way that these, these, these are obviously horrifying but like it is also funny 
in that weirdness because I mean, it's just completely at odds with the way I think about what we do. Um, but yeah, another weird story. Um, another story time YouTube. Um, we were in Gothenburg. We got like, I think 2019 was the year we traveled loads. We went to like 17 European B cities and we didn't really make that much money from it because Europe has got more money than you, the UK in terms of like how much they're willing to put into like um, paying visiting lecturers or like how much money their institutions just generally have to play with. But like, this, I, we did, I swear to God, we spent as much money as we earned just in like buying McDonald's. It was ridiculous. I don't know how we made money in 2019. But um, we went to Gothenburg because we were invited to chair a panel for this art criticism institutional, like this, it was called Le International, which gives you a good idea for how pretentious they were. Um, we kind of like, we read their blurb. We were just saying yes to everything in 2019, especially if it involved travel, because you know, white pube on tour. Um, we were like, we've never been to Gothenburg, fine, whatever, say yes. It was good money as well. Um, but they kind of described themselves as like a conglomerate or like this, this consortium of European institutions um, that were like dedicated to publishing art criticism or like writing about the art. They were just like a, a vague, like we're a website for like writing about art, like art texts, never heard of them. and not to sound conceited, but I, I just, I'd never heard of them and they didn't have much going on on Instagram. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's not happening on Instagram, but like, maybe it's just the website, but like, it, that was the vibe. Like this quite bizarre, mysterious, esoteric art thing, chairing a panel about um, writing online, criticism online, that was their thing. And we were on a panel with three people. We were chairing the panel and um, to, they were meant to send, these panelists were meant to send over like an abstract of what they were gonna talk about ahead of the panel. Cool. Um, that's generally the panel's work. <laughs> um, two of them sent their abstract over. One guy, we'd never heard of any of these people, but like one guy forgot to send things through. Hard relate, big mood, been there. Um, but it was like this was a panel in the middle of summer it was Ramadan so I was fasting and um, Sweden has got like longer daytime hours than the UK so this was like I was doing like 20 hours of like no food just pure bullshit just fucking riding the wave leaving my body just at this point and um <laughs> The first night we turn up in Gothenburg, they um they thought it'd be nice to get everyone together a, a bit early ahead of the panel. Like, just Europe has money. They took us all. They took all of us out for a meal in a Michelin star restaurant before sundown. Um, which is fine because sundown was at eleven p.m. So I was just sat there at the table. No food, no drink, just vibes. <laughs> like, um, and it, it was, yeah, it was, it was just a bit of a weird one. This Michelin star restaurant. <laughs> um, as an aside, it's just like, if you want to know what our friendship is, um, it is Gab turning to the waiter and saying, can she have hers in a doggy bag? Um, <laughs> Michelin star meal for me to eat in bed at 11 p.m., um, which is... <laughs> weirdest iftar I've ever done but um yeah, yeah um so we're all sat at the table and the guy that hadn't sent his abstract abstract along was running late which <laughs> I'm not painting a very good picture of him as a professional but it gets worse um he's not turned up yet we're having a chat everyone's chatting um there's a girl from Spain. There's another guy from Spain. Oh, I cannot remember the institutions these people are from. And do you know what? I really should be able to because this is not good for them. Um, it's like, yeah, they should probably be called out. In some way. Like someone needs to do it um, because this was yeah a bit of a violent. <laughs> but um, 
yeah, we're just having chat. Everyone's having chat. And like it's tense. Um, it's tense in a very specific way because I mean, I'm out of it. I'm on a different plane of existence. Um, delirious. But Gab's having a conversation with these people and they're kind of like, I, do you know what it was? She mentioned how she did 23 and me, like the little DNA test to figure out where your ancestry is from. And um, so she's like, oh yeah, like I just, I got all the data. Like she's from Liverpool. She's like, my family's from everywhere. Like we've got everything coming in. Like it was just interesting to see the breakdown because we don't really know where like my grandma's father was from, like this, that, and the other. Like it's kind of by the by, she like doesn't like <laughs> her surname's Della Puente. And like her, when every time I go to see her nan, she goes, like she, she will turn around to me and say, you know, my maiden name's Mohammed. And I'm like, I know Sheila, yes. We're, I love to think that we're related. Like, <laughs> I love that. Mm, yes. Uh, <laughs> so like Gab's from everywhere, identifies as white and like, that's fine, cool. Like she's not saying that she's a person of color, but the Spanish woman who asked for her goes, like turns around and it's dramatic. Gab's just mentioned 23 and me. I just think it's really bad, these ancestry DNA kits, because it means that like we're essentializing race. And Gab was like, okay. <laughs> it was like tense, like this white woman's telling her off. Like that wasn't the conversation we were having, but like, that was weird. Um, like slightly confrontational, whatever. Um, the guy that hadn't sent his abstract turns up. He's a Swedish man. Um, because <laughs> he's late we're on the end he sits opposite me and um, just my luck um and he like we're just having a chat he tells us about what he does he runs a music festival in Gothenburg apparently it's very big and you know it's a very successful man um he tells us about his thesis that he's just written for his PhD, MA, God knows. Like he's just been studying in some way. And he wrote a thesis on Wittgenstein. Um, so in this environment, me on a different plane of existence, starved. Um, I go, oh, who's he? Is he the racist one? Just fell out my gob. Like, you know, I didn't mean anything by it. I'm just like, I'm not there. Like, I'm not there. It's just not happening. Um, and this guy goes, uh, looks at me like, what? I was like, is he the racist one? And Gav goes, um, what do you mean the racist one? That's all of them. <laughs> and we have a laugh. We have a laugh. Like, oh, yeah, that's all the philosophers. They're all racist. And I was like, oh, no, maybe it was, maybe I'm thinking like Heidegger. Is it Heidegger? I still don't know. Like, there's one of them that's like a massive racist. And I was just trying to differentiate between German philosophers. Like, it was very instant. Um, but he tells, he's like looking at us like across the table, like, I mean, aren't we all racist? It's not just them, we're all racist. That was a racist thing for you to say, that he was, they were all racist. It's racist for you to like, say that they're all racist. And I was, it was, <laughs> it's just one of those moments we are looking at each other over the table, like, both of us at each other. He was looking at us like, and we were looking at him like, I don't remember how we segued out of that, but, but it was just, it was fucking surreal. It was so surreal. So from the off, I was like, I don't like this man. <laughs> um, not a nice guy. Um, so whatever, I eat my I eat my Michelin star meal in bed in my fancy restaurant, like from my fancy restaurant in my fancy hotel room. And like, quite honestly, I would have preferred McDonald's, but like, it just kind of is a weird night. The next day is the panel. Uh, this man still has not told us what he is talking about on the panel but like everyone cool we get to the panel it's in a massive library very weird vibes um we're sat there with these britney mics just mic'd up on like bar stools having a chat like we're westlife <laughs> um and so the panel structure was going to be um everyone on the panel the panelists talk for like 20 minutes they do their abstract they talk about their area of specialism they're all from different institutions around europe they can talk about their thing 
and then we come out on stage and we have a little Q&A discussion, um, debate, forum, whatever. Um, the free marketplace of ideas, I guess, maybe that's what that is. Um, that was the, that was going to be the structure and then questions from the audience and um, so they do their 20 minutes presenting. The first two are fine, whatever, cool, they're talking about their institutions. This guy, cannot for the life of me remember his name, I think it was Alexander. He, Alexander does his 20 minutes. He's talking about a novel he wrote, a white man, a white man wrote this novel about a Syrian refugee that comes to Sweden um, and undergoes psychoanal an psychoanalysis. And the, the novel is split between writing as the Syrian refugee and writing as the psychoanalyst, who's a white person that falls in love or, or like experiences intense sexual desire for their patient. And the, 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 the Syrian refugee, these, these are reductive terms. These are horrible ways for me to talk about two characters that have, one would hope, nuance. Um, like, you know, the person, like one of the people is just, but, but the, these were the terms he was describing these characters in. It was the Syrian refugee, the psychoanalyst. And like, um, I just remember turning to Gab and being like, what the fuck? And we were both just sat there like this, like, are you fucking kidding? So we, we had a little moment to regroup after this, quite frankly. It's, it's just, it was just a really dehumanizing way to talk about a, a, a a character that has a, a really marginalized identity and that identity is how that character is referred to and just stripped of any other part of their humanity they're going to be talked about in these really reductive terms that this this author this guy this this weirdo has no agency at all to talk about or like write from that perspective and then to create like this weird interplay where that 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 character is then fetishized by the psychoanalyst and like it goes on like he was going on about how like it's just like a really like incisive analysis about these marginalized identities so he like he was aware he wasn't ignorant of the fact that race exists and all like the fact that like this was a marginalized identity it was conscious he was trying to be edgy he thought this was cool and we, so we regrouped and we were like, we need to talk about this. <laughs> what, the fuck? Um, what the fuck? So we like just opened the notes app, added some um, questions into our notes and we were like, okay, cool. We'll just, we're just gonna have to talk about it because there's no way we can not talk about it. We're gonna have to ask this man a question. And that has to obviously be our question. Like, are you, are you out of your mind? <laughs> like, what's going on? How are you feeling? What, what was the thought process behind this? Um, and uh, like, so we did, and this was live in front of an audience in this enormous library, and it didn't go down well. He kept looking at us like the questions we were asking were not relevant, and then he he, he we, we were just like, this is really problematic. Like, are you aware of that? Are you aware of like the way that this is like a problematic material for you to engage with and that you don't have like, the agency to write in this way? Like, how do you feel about that as a writer? Like, like if you want to have a discourse, let's do discourse, like discourse happening. Like, let's do it, come on. And he was like, his answers were just like complete shock that this would even be a problem. <laughs> I remember him saying like, this novel is well received in Sweden. And I was like, good for Sweden, but not very well received by me. Like I am not receiving this well. You're a weirdo. Um, and um, it gets worse. So like the, the panel, like everyone having not a nice time because we're talking to this man and he hates us. He hates, he wants us to die. Um, maybe, but um, <laughs> um, like, the other guy from like the museum in Madrid 
I'm asking, I'm like, okay, I just don't want to deal with Alexander right now. I'm going to ask you, Madrid guy, some questions. Um, every single question I asked him, he just looked back at me. Like, am, I, am, I, am I making sense? Am I speaking? Like, a, a, a word's coming out of my mouth. And, I mean, it's Ramadan. I, I'm, I'm delirious. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not making coherent sense. Maybe these questions are stupid. Um, but I remember asking Gab afterwards. I was like, "Why were my questions bad? Like, like we wrote, we we spoke about this. Like, we prepared for this, but like some of them were off the cuff. Off the cuff. Like, were they bad questions? Like, was I not making sense?" And she was like, "No, you were really clever. What are you on about? Like, you made complete sense." And I think I think that was like a panel, a live in person panel version of like not making eye contact with me, but like. It, it was it was it was not a nice experience like that was not a nice thing for me to experience I felt shit it I felt like actually horrible because of that um I mean I don't, I don't care now but like afterwards I was just like I was quite like shook by it I was like oh like that really didn't make me feel good. I really didn't enjoy that experience. And so we came out of the panel afterwards and I was just like, both of us were like fucking exhausted. I was starving. And like, I think I had maybe like two hours until, um, no, not two hours. Yeah, no, two hours until sundown, but Gab was hungry. So we went, we were meant to go out for dinner again, another fancy, different Michelin <laughs> restaurant. I make it sound like our lives are glamorous. They're not. Like this is this is not normal. This is just how much money they had. Um, but like we meant to go to another fancy restaurant, and Gab was like, "Do you want to jib it?" And I was like, "Oh fuck yes!" Like I'm not going. Are you mad? I'm not going for drink. Ramadan, Ramadan. I'm not going for drink. Um, and fuck this. So we were like, we we spoke to the organizer from the international, the international, the person that invited us over that was not on the panel, and we were like, we're gonna go to McDonald's. That was like a really weird experience. And she was like, oh why? What was, and I was like, do you have eyes? Do you not notice? She was like, oh, no, no, go on, explain it to me. I want to hear, I want to hear. And we're like, okay, cool. Um, like, that was a bit of a violent experience. Like, I was like, I'm not feeling good. That was not a nice experience for me. I want to leave. Um, and that man over there is racist. <laughs> like, the man you invited, he's a racist. <laughs> like, just, you need to sort that out. Like, what was that about? Like, he should have sent the abstract in, in advance. Like, not to, we weren't being difficult I think sometimes these like these situations can read as like confrontational but like it, what it wasn't us accusing this woman as the organizer of like failing her due diligence because like, maybe something else was going on in her day god knows not to make excuses for her, but like how like, how's anyone to know that that was going to be like a situation that became confrontational so we were just like we're gonna leave just it's fine bye oh that's the time. Oh, I've not said the juiciest bit though. Okay, I'm gonna repeat. We're, we're gonna do a snooze because I'm just gonna get to the best bit. It's not the best bit, it's the worst bit. Um, so we just leave. We go into McDonald's. We meet a friend of ours who's who lives in Gothenburg and is studying at the university that was there. And we were just like having a chat. He came to the panel. We were talking about it and we were like, what's up with that guy? And he was like, yeah, that's like a really Swedish thing like they just don't see it like that they think they're being woke and like was explaining it to us he's from the UK so he was like able to translate I guess the cultural difference and he was like it was really bad though like that kind of you weren't you weren't like perceiving that weirdly from like just being in it that in the audience read badly um like you didn't do anything wrong but like they were just collectively cap going crazy like and we're like, okay, cool. Gab had some McDonald's. We were in there for about an hour. Like, just having a chat through it. And then... So, I had another hour until I could eat. So we decided to go to a restaurant on the other side of the city, where apparently they do a really good vegan meatloaf. And it was really good. So we went to this specific place so I could have a vegan meatloaf for dinner and we come out and we're waiting for the tram just outside the mcdonald's and all of a sudden i see this guy in the distance like from across the road and i'm like oh shit 
is that Alex Hunter? What the fuck? He crosses the road. He's waited for us outside McDonald's. He's he he's like he saw us go away, and he's been walking around trying to figure out where we are. He didn't realize we we're in McDonald's, but he's he knows that we're about. Um, and he's been waiting for us. And he comes up to me and he's like, "I want to talk to you." I'm like, "Oh shit, fuck, fuck." Um, and Gab's like, "What? What? Like she thinks that." he's talking to both of us and he's like no 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 I want to talk to Zarina I want to talk to Zarina and so Gab's like are you okay like are you okay I'm like yeah it's fine like whatever um and like he's just kind of like not to be like I'm little but like I'm small I'm not like tall or like you know I'm a small person ish I'm like you know but he's a lot bigger than me he's got like he had this like presence that I th- in that moment I really thought he was going to punch me I, I was squaring up for a fight on the streets of Gothenburg I thought I would have to fist fight this man and I don't know whether that was just like me perceiving it weirdly or if he I, I think he was being really aggressive but he was like you th- he kept like, pointing at me he was like you think I'm a bad guy you think I'm like this horrible man like that's got all this power or I'm, I've not got power. Like, I'm not like this guy that has the power to change. He was fucking screaming at me. And I was just sat there. I was just stood there, like, waiting for him to, like, actually hit me. Um, and I, I think it, like, he was yelling and yelling. And I was, like, just trying to make coherent sense of what he was saying. And I was like, it's still, you're still right. Like, that was still a racist book. You've written a racist book. Like, like go away why are you talking to me why do you want me to like fucking tell you you're not racist I still think you're a bad person like you're not okay I don't want to be your friend like what do you want from me and he he just kept like fucking yelling and it ended by the tram arriving and Gab was like fucking action film nonsense grabbed me by the sleeve yanked me onto the tram like that was the only way it was ending he was still screaming while we were on the tram and like I, I don't think that was okay. <laughs> that was very fucking traumatic. Like it's still something that we think about. Like uh, like two years later, like it's still something we talk about. As like that was crazy, wasn't it? Eh? Yeah, that was bad. Like we both had to unpack that separately in therapy. I had a panic attack on the tram. We were both crying over our vegan meatloaf. That was bad, but it was also really funny. <laughs> like that man, that man was crazy. I nearly fist, fist fought a man on the streets of Sweden. It's like a good story now. I'm post therapy. I'm cool with it. But like, yeah, it was big bad shit. That story took up all the time. <laughs> I've got more, but I'll, I'll spare you. <laughs> Yeah, Serena, do you want to do you want to move on? Do you want to go to a break? Yeah, go on. Let's do a break. <laughs> um, let's pop you off the spotlight. Um, okay, thanks so much, um, Serena. I mean, it feels quite funny saying thank you, but also really important to say thank you for um, re reliving, rehashing some of that in the context of what we're hoping to chat about um, what we are chatting about. So we will have a break now. We'll take 10 minutes. Um, So if you're able to um, step away from the screen, um, you might want to use some of this time um, to think about any questions or reflections you might want to share. When we come back, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes um, where Zarina, Carmen and Zipporah and talk together um, and then we'll open it up to questions and Helen and I will help um, like facilitate in those questions. Um, okay so thank you all very much and I'll see you at five past six. Okay welcome back everyone. Hope you've had a nice break. I I'm just um, 
finding Serena, I've lost you in the Zoom gallery. So I'm sure. Just... I pop up if I say something. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, fab. Thank you. There you are. Okay. So, Serena, it feels so strange moving people around, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, welcome to the screen, Zipporah and Carmen, mm. and the, um, the brains and the heart behind Buyer's Remorse. And welcome back, Serena. Um, so, I'm just going to leave you to it to, I guess, process some of that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah I, yeah, I feel like, I hopefully everyone enjoyed the faces me and Zabora made, by the way, because we were emoting heavily, which, yeah. you know, is our job, truly. And I her, you can see us, and that's the point. That's the point, you know, you know we do very good shock faces, and that's the point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a quick info is I'm Carmen, I'm the other half of bias remorse. I I'm third year and I study fine art at the University of Leeds. Mm. I'm Zipporah. I'm the other half of bias remorse. I do art history stuff. I'm also a third year. And thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so let's get down to the Q and A. Mm. Um, so come do do question first. Yeah. So first of all. Thank you, Serena, so much. I think we said that thousands of times, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and we just wanted to pick up on a couple of really interesting points that we felt came up and just kind of hash them out together and reflect and emote and discuss yeah. and do all the wonderfuls. And so one of the things that I noticed, and Zipporah was like making comments while I was writing this down as well, <laughs> but kind of this idea that like our own racialization is invisible to us because in that moment I was like I had done that too and it was that like you know kind of Gab's having to like Gabby having to be like that that was weird <laughs> and like you can be like oh yeah yeah because I know there's definitely moments where like I've had to do it for Zephora Zephora's done it for me mm. and we've done it for our friends as well and yeah just that yeah mm -hmm. I think that's like a definite real thing like I it, I don't, I don't want I don't want to sound flippant about it but like it like it like I'm really glad that I work in this way with Gab like, like I would not do the art world on my own like I don't I don't think I for one I don't think I'd on my own have kind of like made it in that way because I think in some way I've benefited from like in at the beginning I was kind of like being a bit flippant and saying like she experiences this weird these weird racialized moments because of me but I also I think in an active way benefit from like the white privilege that she has like she can kind of and so in I like that I really like that it feels nice because like we can kind of hustle it together and she can say things in certain rooms that I would kind of um really not be able to get away with and that I would be like perceived as super aggressive if I say if I say them but like there have been times where like um I went to go see a show at Spike Island in Bristol and this was actually a, a review that we wrote about so like I'll spare you the theatrics but it was Zoe Paul I think at Spike Island where she had like these these heads these vases that were in the shape of heads um and painted black and she she used them as jugs and I went and she was like in the middle of this press viewing like just whacked her hand up and was like this is racist are you going to talk about that and if I said that like it would just not have flown like I was the only person of color in that room it wouldn't have worked like it, it, I would have been the aggressor but because it was her that said it, like she all of it, like the artist was like, you know, that's the second time that someone said that. I really need to think about that. Like, 
I need to I need to think about this and be honest I swear to god like this was her reaction like really introspective and like I'll take that on board and then afterwards the rest of the critics and like the people in the room were like I'm so glad you said something like how you're so brave for saying something and I was like oh, you are all full of shit like you all could have said something like you just so full of shit um like I was like <laughs> we were pissing ourselves it was so stupid but like yeah like beyond just her being able to point out the ways that these things work like it's also like her being able to like throw herself into situations that I can't really I can't function in those ways so I can like function through her in that particular way it like it works in so many ways um so yeah really grateful for Gab in that in that sense because sometimes you do need affirmation you need someone else outside of yourself to kind of just confirm it and I, I think it's the way that racism works in the UK especially when it comes to institutions it works in a way that like makes you feel crazy and yeah. it literally it literally took going to therapy and like I did CBT which is a specific kind of therapy that like it's meant to equip you with the tools to like deal with the problems you have a bit more like level-headedly because you know well, whatever like however it phrases it like but I just remember having these conversations with my therapist god bless Daniel and god bless the NHS for this because I remember having these conversations with him where I was like this is all the shit I have experienced and he was like literally none of that is your fault and all you can do is just release like any kind of ownership over it you can't affect that these things happen to you like because you're not in control of like racism you just need to like you just need to fit, like stop tying it to your sense of self and I was like I don't but like this like, these things have like a mental impact and like how like how are you as an individual meant to transcend like <laughs> structural racism <laughs> and then, like it's, there's no way like it's just you've you're just within it and you've got to be able to see that you're outside of it but it takes a whole therapist to make you do that like it's I think yeah that's so true because i feel like the way racism works especially in the uk is literally just like that is just like this inherent like invisibility to like the idea that racism is a thing and mm -hmm. like it actually exists it's just like it was like the recent royal scandal and such mm -hmm. it's just like there's still people like basically being like wait but racism like exist and I'm just like yes <laughs> it actually it, it actually it actually does it actually does and for like people in this country to le legitimately be like wait I thought we live in a post-racial society it's just like there's a level of ignorance that exists with racism that is also like this silencing factor that you just experience and I feel like we've both it's like we've all experienced this and it's just like you you feel it but because like even that person doesn't acknowledge that they've done this violence to you it feels even more violent because just say wait am I overreacting or is yeah. this actually that deep and it really is that deep <laughs> all the time mm -hmm. and it's just like it's just like really just so it, it's weird how it messes your mind it's like it's very strange but yeah <laughs> no that's it like that you hit the nail on the head like that's the part of it that feels fucked up because it's not just that like it, especially with that like royal racism like that, that that felt like emotional on so many different levels but like it was most affecting in the way that like Megan was able to kind of articulate a very British kind of racism mm -hmm. from like a, the, the perspective of someone kind of outside of it but like within it having experienced it but like you know outside of it as an American like able to articulate in a very detailed way like the pettiness of how British racism works that it's so like it, it's so coherent but so like non sequitur like it's yeah. so it follows no logic of like it's literally just like I don't like you because of your identity so I'm gonna treat you in all of these ways that will make you feel like you're going mad and mm. never talk it's so under the skin so implicit so like baseless 
like mm -hmm. the only base for it is identity and yeah I think that, I, like yeah I guess that's part of it yeah sorry no yeah I just wanted to like add that like there is this like insidious role that like there's this like this insidious nature to it mm -hmm. that I feel like has this like slow release effects on people of color that I felt and I know that a lot of people felt where it's just like slowly you just start to realize in your head you're like wait a second <laughs> <laughs> and you start to change that's it's the bad true. thing is it makes you mm. shrink slowly mm. and steadily to fit into this box because you're just like right, slowly yeah. getting chipped away at and you don't realize it and I think um Nicola's gonna love this but I'm just saying <laughs> But just um but we had a speaker come in and she wrote a piece called the sunken place and and i loved it so much and i ended up using it in my um dissertation and, um, and i remember reading it and being like oh <laughs> that, was it, like, it was like it was catharsis but it was also just this hopelessness just being there like you mean it doesn't change <laughs> like it just keeps coming it looks like oh god i have to like plaster over these holes in the walls and build them back up like kind of thing but like yeah i just wanted to add that too <laughs> no jenna's a good shout because i think that all of the stuff not to be more of a best but like <laughs> In a way, Jenna's really good at articulating it, like the very specific way that racism works within an institution, because like, but like, you know, the rest of society can exist in this way that like, is kind of like, oh, Britain's the least racist country, like, you know, oh, it's the least racist country. And it's like, well, some racist is still racist, Darren. Um, but like, the arts kind of see themselves as this like, like the art industry, has this self-perception as an industry that is like super progressive, super left-wing, super liberal, oh my God, we love inclusion. And the way that racism in, in the arts works, that Gemma articulates really well and that you kind of hit on, is that insidiousness of like, this isn't happening. We're not racist. We're not like, you know, we didn't vote for Brexit actually. So we can't be racist. Um, it makes you question yourself and I think with Gemma, her writing like writes about the specific brand of institutional racism so eloquently and like incisively, like she picks it apart like for, like it's forensics. And I kind of like in my career, I try to avoid the institution in any way possible because I'm like I'm very aware of the way that that like institutional racism works, like in in terms of like it will make you think that you're mad it will make you shrink yourself and it will just kind of deflect any attempts to like categorize it or um identify it even um you know like institutional diversity policy exists for a reason and that is to like perpetuate the same problem and, like Gemma writes about that really well and so like you'd have thought I'd have done a really good thing by like just being this independent critic that like bumbles about free and like avoids the institution never does anything so, like never is employed meaningfully by any institution but it still gets you it catches up there's no escape there's no there's no fucking escape like the institution will find some way because they hold the money like they that they hold the money that is it that is the like there is no way to avoid dealing with institutional racism on that structural scale because they hold the fucking money and that to me is very depressing. <laughs> uh, it really is, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like we have to kind of live in that reality, right? I mean, we have to, or we can't. Because it is the reality. <laughs> <laughs> like, there, there is, there is yeah. that fact where like, even buyer's remorse, like we have this, I'm gonna be careful, but we have this like tether to Leeds University where we wanna critique it, we wanna make these, changes but they hold the money you know mm -hmm. we still have to jump through their hoops we have to work through their remit yeah. and that's something that I feel like because this is something me and Sephora want to do as this is our like these are our ambitions for like the next couple of years and I'm going to say career because that's <laughs> I'm 22 I don't think about that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but like, <laughs> like, 
thank you. See, I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded, so my mom can't say anything. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> like, but like, that's like that's something that we've started to experience, and I can only imagine like you've been at this longer than us that this is just like a part of the this relationship will always be like that and we just have to be we have to be okay with it like or we have to like okay with it but not okay with it but we have to there's an element of like a little bit and have to just like dodge it you know yeah oh break with her oh we got a vibe with institutional racism (laughs) yeah like that just has to be the thing (laughs) but also to another point of like how people like around like in the institution process trauma in such like uh I don't know in this type of just like humorous like we have to laugh at it kind of way kind of thing of just like we exist in, it, in this institution that is like very compact com- combative against us but like we need to process trauma to like in like I don't know like I don't know if it's a healthy way but I feel like a lot of people that I talk to who are like minorities who are black like we we laugh and we're just like oh this like crazy bad bad thing happened to me and just like but it was it was hilarious and you did that a lot when you were talking about your experiences and I thought it was just like very interesting of how we react to things like this and how we process things like this in our brains you know I think I think it's super generational such as well like I know I think about, I think, do you know what it is? Because like, yeah, when you leave the, like when you leave the institution of like your art school, it's gonna be like a new different kind of fuckery. And like, I just wanna clarify, you shouldn't be like, have to be okay with it. It's not about like coming to terms with it. You can definitely function in a way where you're holding it at arm's length and like maneuvering around it. It's still gonna be something that you have to maneuver around and like constantly negotiate your position towards and like, how your position towards it is like mm. something that you shouldn't have to deal with um but there are ways to kind of like be sneaky mm. like stuff <laughs> yeah yeah like there are ways to kind of subvert things and like get something on your own terms or like ways to um misappropriate the funds that they give you and just like redistribute it in your own systems and like there are ways to work within underneath it that um I find thrilling and interesting and like as a critic I'm fascinated by how other people do it and um the ways that they like focus in on their communities and like do that work um but I think that one of those ways is by laughing at it (laughs) and I think being able to see the institution's racism as like a part of its own incompetence is kind of in one way inaccurate because it's completely it, it, it is completely on purpose it's completely on purpose it's, it, it's it's meticulous it works in a very premeditated way but it also is fundamentally about like white mediocrity and you know what I mean like it, it's it's not it's mediocre white men that email me and tell me to die and like call me the p-word and like it's mediocre white men that like you know that it's not it's not people who are good at their job it's people that are threatened by me being good at my job and mm. like that that fear being replaced so like i think thinking about the way that like racism works as like a, a as a fundamental kind of I, I guess insecurity like a white a specific kind of white insecurity like it is funny <laughs> that just is fundamentally funny and i think generationally how we conceptualize it within humor is like it, it's yeah i think that's generational i don't know how good it is though like <laughs> i like that take on it though because i feel yeah. like it's um like one of my favorite things to do is to well if anyone follows bias remorse <laughs> instagram we process through memes and that is like how we like communicate mm-hmm. our like nihilism at the same time yeah and um and I think the complaints have that same like <laughs> like it's funny it's silly yeah I think it's a specific kind of nihilistic humor that's just like it's it's bad but like I always think it's just like it's so bad that you have to laugh at it or or just cry about it and or, or just be depressed so you kind of just have to laugh at mm-hmm. the thing and
and it wouldn't be as I feel like it'd be disempowering some type of way when yeah. you're just like, oh, that's funny though. You yeah, know? there's something about laughing in the face of someone that yeah, and laughing in the face of the institution that kind of could be like a yeah, because you don't yeah. take it so seriously. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yeah, um, I think Serena, do you want to jump on or should we reset? Oh, no. No, no, cool. Um, I was just gonna say maybe it's like peak unbothered, like to laugh at it. That's like the ultimate yeah. distancing it from yourself and like separating it from like your own sense of self. Maybe mm-hmm. Daniel would be proud at me laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, that was it. No, I really like that. Yeah. It's another way to reframe it than like the way we were going. We were like laugh in the face of nihilism. <laughs> like, <you're okay. laughs> um, but yeah, I wanted to. Um, there was something else I wanted to bring in and it was mainly to, re- directly responding to um, some of the events you discussed and so let me know if it's like a let's not or let's go kind of thing but um, I just wanted to kind of wonder your thought kind of get your thoughts on the responsibility of enforcing our own safety mm-hmm. and kind of advocating for ourselves against the violence that's external and you can tell I wrote this down because it's well but no jokes so but yeah no, I just wanted to bring that forward because I thought that was like a really important point to kind of extend mm. into the discussion that's a really good point like it's like yeah it's down to us to like set those but like the police aren't going to enforce my like the fact that I'm worthy of protection like you know the police are not gonna sit there and advocate for me in that way like giving I'm not gonna be protected by the police um like it's down to me to kind of like safeguard myself and like me and Gabrielle just like put those safeguarding measures in place and I like I don't know how to do that yet I don't quite know how because because I think it was last weekend I had to I had to post something on Instagram about um I don't know the weird gendered shit that we've experienced and in my case I think so much of it has been gendered and along racial lines like people it's a lot of white men sending me creepy DMs and white men that we've worked with interacting with me in like a really aggressively sexual way that I don't know about and like that I find out through other means but like the way that like I am conceptualized as a woman like it is in their minds racialized and it kind of gives them mentally a way to like like it's a way for them to like it's fetish it's fetishism like like it's kind of like I'm fetishized in this very specific way um because of like race but also because of gender and they kind of like are together and I didn't I don't know what to do about it I don't know what to do about it beyond like having a yell on Instagram and like trying to use that as a place of catharsis and trying to like let them know that I know that that's happening like the, the, the that Instagram post was about like specific incidents and like I want those people to know that I know that they've done that and that like, they, they probably do I've blocked them now but like so they definitely know but like I just want to like mention how much I know about those in- incidents like I feel like I have to write about it on Instagram and like turn it into a thing and assert like verbally assert a boundary there with that post and be like I know that that's happening like I'm not going to just not mention it um and I don't know if that's the perfect way to do it. I don't know if that's a good way to do it, but it's a way that felt good afterwards. Like I felt like a weight had been lifted. Um, I think there's something, it, 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 mm, it's very much like a um, individual thing, I, I guess. Like it, it's kind of, maybe there isn't like a good way. There's no good way to assert your boundaries. It's just like what works for you in the moment. and. I think sometimes it, it can kind of like I'm a, I'm allowed to do that because I've got a stupid number of followers on Instagram 
you know if i had 700 followers on instagram me posting about those specific incidents would hit in a very different way i'd feel less it would feel more like shouting into the void i feel like i felt a catharsis from posting that thing because it plonked in and then all of a sudden like in my personal my personal instagram account like women and non-binary people i know were messaging me being like oh like i'm so sorry this happened to you and like that felt good i felt seen and heard and recognized and like there was commonality in my experience like people like friends message me on, on whatsapp afterwards and they're like that's so fucked up like but also i love you and you're so held and like that was emotional i don't know if that would ha have happened if we didn't have like visibility and power as the white puke, you know? And so like, I, I don't I don't know how other people would go about asserting their boundaries. I don't know how successful they would feel that that assertion of their boundaries would be. And that scares me, that's fucking terrifying. Mm -hmm. Like that really is terrifying to me because th there's only an answer for me. Like me, myself, I can only answer for myself. And, my answer relies on so many different bits of power that I've like managed to staple to myself <laughs> through all these like these means that other people just don't have access to. Um, so yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, I think it's very interesting though, like the idea of like what like advocacy means for yourself, and just like I remember like listening to someone and they they were positing like the actual thing of just like there are no safe places left on the internet and stuff like that's very depressing but like I feel like this kind of goes to just like the art world and institutions of just like there is no safe place in the institution and just like really as like minorities like you have to find how you can advocate for yourself because it's very personal because there is no external place where we can go to being like I've been wronged and have people have your back and to know that they will help you and when you when you exist in that world you need to find your own ways to advocate for yourself in those spaces and it can be a lot of things but I feel like it's the most of just exercising your power in any way that you can and and exercising your power in a way that like increases your own subjectivity and your own sense of personal power, kind mm. of. Because mm. it's just like, it's hard. But I would like to add two cents. I think that like, there is some power that we share collectively. Mm. And I think that's why like, an example is like, Serena comes and she talks and then we talk mm -hmm. and then the Q&A they talk and it's like I feel like it can be lonely but there are and it is to an extent like mm -hmm. you have to stand in your own truth but there are times where we can rely on our people in our situations who can be like I'll share my power yeah and I think it's I mean this is me like being incredibly like trying to live in some hope of yeah. like they're, they're, they're being crushed and being depressed <laughs> <laughs> this is the dynamic <laughs> it's like um that there that there is this like power within our within our communities and that we can breathe bridge like this form of power together mm -hmm. and i mean granted everyone can disagree with me and you know we can discuss it but i do want to i do want to like put that as an offering mm -hmm. alongside that and be like there is to there is this like unity together in the spaces we create for each other mm. really yeah. no you're right I think like it's not like blind optimism I think you're like you're bang on like both of you are bang on I love this you're bang on um <laughs> because like in a way you've got to kind of you just kind of you just, you just gotta kind of use what you've got and like try and leverage whatever like whatever little power you have you're going to try and use that to leverage some kind of just something that looks like justice for yourself and that, that i think that power can often be found in community and 
and it's it, like for me it's like beyond gab like it's also like a network of like brown and black creatives in like in and around London that have like been based in London like that's that's my community that's who holds me and that's who like I want to write to and about and that's like a way for me to redirect my power towards like other people and like lift them up and like point at them and give them the critical attention that they deserve that they're not getting from a critical outlet but it also like flows the other way when um like you know in these like interpersonal moments when I just need somewhere to like fall and for the longest time a bit too long I was a bit obsessed with like the idea of like a union like maybe there could be a union and like it could be legislated formally in that way maybe it could but I don't know if that's possible in the short term it's just maybe it's like it's possible in like super informal ways but there is real power in that collective like bargaining I guess when it comes to institutions that's where I found that we have got leverage like if an institution doesn't want to pay us like a certain amount of money for like the extra labor we're going to be doing talking about like racism I like we've emailed like the uh, the tape wanted us to do a talk about um collective manifestos and it was us another artist and another collective and they wanted to pay us all the same fee but like the collectives would have to figure out like for themselves how they were going to divide that 200 pounds I think it was between themselves regardless of how many members they had like we were two people the other collective was um I think four or five people so like 200 pounds 50 quid if that um so we all emailed the tape together at the same time <laughs> on the phone hit like hit send at the same time just saying like I don't, I don't want to do it unless you want to pay us that fee each for whoever's attending and whoever's speaking and we'll decide how many of those how many of us speak because it's a collective manifesto it doesn't make sense if you like are only paying us one thing because on our manifesto is we all want to be paid a normal amount of money like that's a political stance like clock on and like I, I think just in that collective action of emailing them at the same time like kind of just coordinating across across the board it kind of like what are they going to do re-curate the whole thing like no the curators are too like no offense to curators but like that's a big job and they're a bit lazy um you know they've really done the work of putting it together so like it, it is more financially responsible for them to just shell out um and like that's an informal collective action like that's not like the formal movement of a union but like it, it functions in a similar way that's still collective bargaining and in other like um i guess more implicit or like um less quantifiable or um like emotional ways i think that collective power can really be harnessed and utilized as well like so you you're absolutely bang on yeah mm -hmm. I'm just aware of time because I know that the audience is probably like itching to jump <laughs> on as well. Uh, so we'll do one more and then we'll open it up. Yeah. Um, lost my page. Hold on. Um, I guess I just wanted to last kind of point to bring in um, the kind of in the whole Gothenburg, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> there are many things to bring up, but I just. Choosing one. I was then, very gripped by that story. Yeah, we could have gripped ages. But, <laughs> and we, uh, <laughs> it's insane. Incredibly, incredibly. It's absolutely that <laughs> And like, I think our faces communicated that. <laughs> there was, I just wanted to like hammer in on the point that Dehu the dehumanization of referring to someone explicitly by how they are monetized. Yeah. Just because I know it's something that the collective we in this room have probably experienced yeah. based on the fact that like black woman <laughs> and yeah. black woman <laughs> and, like, and like stuff like that and how that like really centers how we sit on that seat of oppression of yeah. female and 
biological sex, not even gender at that point, biological sex mm. and bio and ethnicity or I'm not gonna say biological risk because that's not <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a bad bad topic. Bad topic, bad topic. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's say the concept of race. The concept of race. Yeah. And just so yeah, if you wanted to speak on that, how our labels, mm. that's the word, our labels can act as like vehicles for oppression in yes. a way. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I right. Because obviously, like we me and Gavin been back and forth about that situation. It's like our favorite topic of conversation. Like so crazy but I think for me what I really yeah within that label it, it it just really it really cemented for me like that wasn't a super Swedish thing to happen that was a super art world thing for it to happen it wasn't about Europe it was about the art world like the European art world that's the way that like we all see Sweden as this like very progressive nation right like the art world sees itself as so so progressive that's the way that like whiteness works when it self-identifies as progressive as liberal as like me i can't be racist I'm like oh. like it, you know like if just there is no like that's what happens you end up like doing an othering like doing a dehumanization while thinking that you're like try like, in your mind conceptualizing it as woke and it and then when you're challenged about it, it it becomes actual violence like because it challenges your sense of self like i can't be racist me no i've done so much for the people like it it, it it's like a it, it's a super 2021 like it's a super like it feels recent as a way for that racial violence to be expressed because like it's not the same now as it was when my mom was growing up like you know my mom would have to leg it from skinheads like she grew she up in Wembley and it makes no sense that there would be skinheads in Wembley so I'm like oh it's all it's all Indians around there but like back then there were skinheads and like she'd have to leg it home from school so that she wouldn't get fucked up and that's not something I have to actively deal with, but like th this is the way that like whiteness kind of reasserts itself. Like um, it's like a new, like that channel has been closed down. Now all of a sudden like that super explicit form of racism is no, we don't like, we're not doing that anymore. Like white society is post-racial, Blair is like Blairite kind of multi-racial happy crappy society happened like historically that's what like that was like the end point um not really <laughs> i'm being sarcastic but like you know that was the end of it we're like post-racial britain now we're multicultural and we're like proud of it um all of a sudden like whiteness has to like it's like a pimple it's got to pop up somewhere else and this is like the new way that it handles it like renegotiates itself in relation to like the limits that are placed around it you can't call someone a racial slur because that's explicit violence and like a white person will call you out on that. But you can do this other like really weird, insidious, under the skin way. And like white people will not even recognize it. It will be like the blinders are on. Like you can't be racist. He has not got, he has not got racist bone in his body. Like that's, yeah, it's, that's the way it works. It's not like, it's not out loud verbal, like, saying the quiet part out loud it's like these labels are now tools for them to enact a violent by acknowledging those tools those labels like it it becomes like a, a tool and a weapon for them to instrumentalize yeah mm, yeah yeah that's a very good way to articulate it because i feel like that's like an experience that i feel like a very generational thing of just like how racism kind of got like enacted to yeah. people so I feel like I don't know like with my dad like he would always say that he was very happy with like how I have more opportunities now because when he came to England he would just shout slurs at him from the street when he was like a, ch a full child mm -hmm. so he was just like I'm so happy but it's just like when I experience racism it's just like 
incredibly subliminal and it's just like it's like and if I'm the only black person in that room it's just like I'm the only one who perceives her and it's very alienating it's very terrible so mm. I really really get that. yeah and it's, really better. it's like it's now no longer like physical or like it's not primarily physical it's primarily mental obviously that physical shit still happens like I still thought that man was going to batter me in the street, like. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's like it, it it takes place primarily on like a mental plane, psychological. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just want to jump in before we keep going. <laughs> questions, please. But, yeah. If anyone has questions, because we could go all day. And, yeah. Like, we, <laughs> we need to. <laughs> no, <that's enough. laughs> yeah, exactly. There's too many people who talk in the same room. <laughs> we can't. We can't do it. We can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah does, does anyone have any questions you, you you can either unmute yourself or you can put in the chat and mm-hmm. we can read it out nicola and i think nicola and helen are going to come in and read out loud or mm-hmm. do you want to um i guess if we need to we'll see if anything pops up in the chat um or would anyone in the zoom room like to unmute themselves and i guess it really doesn't have to be like a question or anything fully formed it can be a reaction a reflection saying thanks like whatever whatever i don't think we asked a single question we're just more reflective so <laughs> yeah exactly take our lead <laughs> hello hello hi hi i'm not lloyd i'm this is my dad's name <laughs> <laughs> This is his computer, but I, a theme that you guys have, um, I guess, touched on quite a bit is the racial gaslighting, like the not believing when things happen. And because I've been in that place myself where I've had to like, it's even taken me years sometimes to process that I've actually experienced <laughs> racism. and. I um, enjoyed what you're saying about the like um, how whiteness reinserts itself, like um, how white power has changed from you know um, slave trade and colonialism to um, you know Britain and then multicultural Britain and then how it is like now like the neoliberal oh we're not racist we're like super woke um, you know social. <laughs> Um, was it social justice warriors and that could never that could never be me I experienced that a lot at university and I think um, the university is a space where that that kind of idea is propagated but um, yeah I, re- I just want to say I, I really um, enjoyed the like talk about racial gaslighting because it is very affirming <laughs> for other people of color to hear that like that happens and yeah that's what what I wanted to say my two cents no oh, yeah it's it's yeah you're bang on the money as well by like identifying it as a neoliberal a, a part of the neoliberal political project because and this is like a soft thought hot off the press <laughs> but like i think it is like it it you're bang on it like it reduces these interactions to the level of the individual and if, if you yourself as an individual see yourself as the kind of person that's incapable of doing that racism like it wasn't intentional like that wasn't my intention and this is taking place on an inter, like an individual interpersonal level like you just completely ignore the wider structure that this exists within like oh it's not racist for me to say that I was just saying this like oh like you're being touchy like that that's a neoliberal that's a part of the neoliberal political project that sees these things as like it measures um it measures these interactions on the scale of the individual whether it's um you know as, as a byproduct of like classical li- like right liberalism or whether it's just about like the way that we should interact with entities like and and capital in general like you know how we should be able to buy our way to the nhs like you know mark like privatize the nhs because we should be able to buy that like opening it up as a new market that's a neoliberal thing that's yeah Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, that was. I, was, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it, it did it make did, a little bit. It did, it did <laughs> make a little bit. It's a great angle to put it in. Yeah, it's a really great, a really great angle. Thank you so much for that response. And yeah, some... thank you so much, Lois. And there's someone else who jumps in and said, "Unconscious bias is training is responsible for that." Ah, unconscious bias. I think that's very true. I feel like that's down to the point of just like, cause like the, this country doesn't acknowledge racism as an actual thing that's like this thing of just like this like like kind of subliminal education of just like of like this is all right and to react mm -hmm. like this is fine it's, it goes unchecked basically yeah basically yeah and oh there's another one uh ah just thank you Mitra who left a lovely comment um in the in the chat oh did we no. um it's out here lolling at the fact that I'm from Sweden with a Syrian Kurdish refugee parents. This talk really resonated with me. Thanks, everyone. Hmm. That's really fun. Um, and also Sam jumps in again, which is it exonerates the institution from racism. And yeah, I think that's definitely um, something that we really wanted to, that I think will just keep popping up mm. is the fact that like the, I, I remember I was in a talk and I think it was Griselda Pollock and she discussed the fact that um, the kind of biggest, um, actually it was Griselda Pollock quoting Martin Luther King, mm. discussing the fact that like the biggest issue is the, the kind of the person A who is comfortable with the norm, but also the person who thinks they're already, they don't have to do anything. Yeah. They're just chilling. Mm. Like they're just there like, nope, I'm fine. <laughs> like <laughs> racism solved it. Exactly. I've got I, my button. I'm done. I've worked as well because, like, when that that happens, then like you do get questioned and you get very defensive. Mm. And because you think that you don't have to progress anymore, like you will not progress. And that's like kind of one of the most dangerous types of racism because they don't realize that they're doing it, mm. and it's so insidious because they think that you're help they're helping you. You know. Yeah. And then someone brought in and said, thank you for sharing your experience. Currently, I seem to get shouted down for even mentioning racism. It's something I should just get over and a chip on my shoulder. Serena, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I think like, like both of those things, like the, those mentions of like unconscious bias training as like exonerating the institution from racism. And this idea that like, the person that points out racism is the, then becomes the problem. Like both of those things, Sarah Arnold has written a festival about really, really well. Um, like the way that like um, the woman of color that points out uh, racism or uh, sexism like becomes all of a sudden responsible for solving it or like becomes the problem by pointing out the problem. Like you point out the problem, you become the problem. Um, and I think she's like, Sarah Ahmed's also written really well about um, that unconscious, the way that like diversity policy basically. <laughs> like, I, I think Gemma, um, I love Gemma so much, but Gemma's <laughs> um, This Work Isn't For Us is like really good at forensically dissecting the way that institutional diversity policy creates a, a cyclical point of beginning, right? Like, it's you're always constantly you're constantly beginning and we saw it last summer we saw it last summer with those institutions being like we're going to put together a task force we're going to do instant like we're going to do like unconscious bias training for everyone and it's like these people like it's first of all it's, like these people haven't had that, that unconscious bias training already and like you know they're still okaying and like still doing this shit and like still the tate is still fundamentally definitely racist and the Tate Britain still has like a racist mural in its basement and still put that horrible fucking racist painting in the British Baroque show these are all consistent problems and every time they're raised it's like well either you the person pointing it out of the problem and we're going to hound you out of employment or we're going to start from the beginning and it's like those are two concrete like ways on the spectrum of like ways that you can deflect that criticism there's a ways for it to handle it. And it's like part of the institutional toolkit for just shedding the critique that hits it. Um, and I think Gemma does a really good job of like 
examining the way that works because she really correctly identifies that the institution doesn't have a problem with recruiting diverse candidates. It, 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 it gets the applications in, it like just shoves them into a funnel system that exists alongside the main institution that like sidelines them and marginalizes them further, like as if their identity is not enough. <laughs> it's like margin, marginalization, like literally separate them from the rest of the employees under this diverse higher category. Um, and like it just, the sector struggles with retention, not with bringing diverse candidates in. It's not about hiring, it's about retention. Um, I think, yeah, both of those things, in those last two comments, like, are part of the same problem. They're connected. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. Just want to pop in because I think, I think about um, this is from Anne. And I hope I'm not saying, I hope I'm saying that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you for this evening. It's been really great. I was really interested in your thoughts on using humor. I think about the use of humor a lot. I haven't got a question, but I appreciate your thoughts and insights on it. Mm. Do you reckon it's a healthy coping mechanism? I feel like it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's not. <laughs> I feel like as long as it is correlated with, it can't be the only coping mechanism is my belief. Mm -hmm. You have to, uh, we can't stop it. Yeah. Because sometimes that's the knee jerk is just to go like, ha 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 ha. This is so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I think the other part of it is, okay, I'm gonna take care of myself now. <laughs> like, I'm gonna, I think that's the important part. Take, like, I think that's very important. Like taking care of yourself is something I, I often forget. I'm just like, oh, a racist experience. And then just, I laugh at it and I don't decompress it. It just lives in my mind. It's just like, mm -hmm. guess that happened. I just don't process it properly. Cause I think we're not taught to process it properly. That's the thing. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like it depends on how you see other people like processing racism. And I feel like a lot of times, I don't know, I feel like the knee-jerk reaction for me with processing racism was always humor because like my friends did that. And like I feel like when I saw my parents processing racism, like they would laugh as well. And like, or they just wouldn't process it. They would just be like, um, okay then, and just move on. And I, I feel like this might be part of just like the like the famous part of the black community not really being like stable in like mental health and like not having like not being part of like the mental health game, not taking mental health seriously. But also it's just like this thing of just like how there is no onus on how to process racism properly and there's no guidebook to how you process racism. So there's this thing of just like the body protecting itself and I feel like the natural reaction is to laugh basically because I feel like it's the most protective measure you can have when you mm. do that but yeah that's what I think <laughs> I'm gonna just I'm sorry because it's five to seven right um, oh, oh my god I know I know um so I'm going to have to bring things to a close. Um, yeah, would you prefer to stay here and chat? Um, I, um, I guess I've also just been sitting here like um, kind of observing the way that my emotions have passed through my body from the beginning of the talk now to the end. And just when we're talking about processing things, that's really resonating with me. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone for being here and thank you to Zarina and Carmen and Zipporah, um, I guess for this most immediate moment of processing, but for the other processing that will continue to happen and settle and hope, yeah, maybe for us all in, in different ways. Um, so I give thanks. I have a couple of things to say about buyer's remorse as well, um, that if you are a student at the University of Leeds um, there and you are a black person or a person of colour in the school, there is a workshop um, that's being um, held this Saturday from three till five. Um, 
uh, which is, oh great, thank you Helen for popping that in the chat, um, a workshop to begin thinking about how you would approach decolonizing your curriculum. Yeah. And it is being run, I'm just double checking, I've got Abiha's surname right. Abiha Khan is running that workshop. Um, so do sign up if you kind of fit the bill. Um, our next buyer's remorse talk will be from Griselda Pollock, um, who Carmen mentioned before. Griselda is an art historian of post-colonial feminist studies. Um, she taught at the University of Leeds for a really, really long time. She's still a professor there. So Griselda's coming to talk to us, particularly about being in the university and, and her experiences. That is on the 7th of April and the, um, the sign up thingy will be available soon. And I think um, if you don't already, follow us on social media. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Great, shout out, shout out. And I think that is it. Um, I hope you all have a great evening and thank you again um, for joining us.